so this is a sort of summary of where we got to, I suppose. We've we've introduced all sorts of stuff. We've introduced wavefronts, circular plane wavefronts. We've talked about terminology to do with uh, wavelength, with frequency, with wave speed. Uh, we've talked about phase and phase difference. I mean, there's actually quite a big slew of stuff uh, we've talked about so far. And then we talked about reflection, and I gave you a trigonometric um, proof, or at least an outline proof of how that works and why it is we will get an angle of incidence that's always going to be equal to an angle of uh, reflection. And remember, all of our angles, in fact, throughout your entire career here, these angles are always going to be measured with respect to the normal. And that is the perpendicular to the interface that we're considering. So if it's a surface rather than a line, as we've got on the screen, then obviously it's perpendicular uh, in every direction. And as you progress later on and you get into multi-dimensional vectors, there's no reason why you can't talk about a normal in any dimensional space you like. It just has to be perpendicular to whatever the axes are in that space. Okay, so a normal is going to carry through in all sorts of contexts as we go on. But we took that a little bit further uh, and then talked about refraction. So passing from one medium into another. And the key point there, you'll remember, is that wave speed does not stay the same between medium, between medium one and medium two, I should say, in this case. All right, so in the case of water, and we looked at the wave patterns off the Tankerton coast as an example, uh, that can vary according to the depth of water. Uh, in terms of light going into water, into glass, whatever it might be, uh, it's the speed of light that's changing uh, in the medium. All right, so the speed of light that you hear quoted as being invariant uh, the one that is at the heart of Einstein's special relativity theories, for instance, it's always referring to light in vacuum. Put it in any other medium, and the wave speed changes. In fact, what we'll see later in today's lecture is that the wave speed varies depending on which wavelength you're talking about. So one color of light will have a different wave speed to another color of light, right? if the medium is not a vacuum. Excuse me. So this is a bit of a run through of where we got to. Let's now move on to uh, a fresh topic in this area, and it's where we're really going to get into this wave speed stuff a little bit more. Uh, and it's the area of dispersion. Now dispersion is going to be quite important for you. It's actually a generic term that covers a lot of things. Um, so, you know, light going into a prism, for instance, sunlight being split, split into its spectrum of colors is an example of dispersion. But we get dispersion happening in other contexts as well. Um, dispersion works in terms of a, of a prism uh, with light going through it because the wave speed is dependent on the color of the light. OK, and you remember we have the relationship in Snell's law. We had sine i times n1 is equal to sine r times n2, or the fractional version of that if you prefer learning it that way. Uh, and that was equal to the ratio of wave speeds, c1 and c2. So that's actually how a prism works in terms of splitting sunlight up into, into its constituent colors. The refractive index of, uh, of red light is less than the refractive index of blue light. Right, so the dispersion is different from the term. I'm just going to shut this guy's phone call now. I guess we don't all want to hear about it. Um, he did warn me that it was coming, so it's not a big deal. It's just that let's keep it private. Um, so here's, you know, this this you will have seen umpteen times, right, in reality, in textbooks, wherever. And it's precisely why a prism will do what a prism does. Uh, because the wave speed for red and blue light is different. So it disperses the light, it spreads it out. That's where the word dispersion is coming from in this context. All right, so that was dispersion, as in how the prisms work and so on. We'll talk about dispersion in, in other forms later on, where you actually need 
Uh, in fact, you don't need to pass through anything at all, but we'll, um, we'll come up with the uh, equations for that later on. It's quite neat stuff. So diffraction is our next topic. Uh, and diffraction is, is associated with the fact that waves uh, will uh, spread out as they go past a barrier. Uh, it's usually way too small an effect to see with visible light. So we're all comfortable with the fact that light travels in straight lines. So the builders have been climbing all over the England building for the last six months with their laser spirit levels and all the rest of it. Um, have not had a problem in a practical sense using those at all. Right? But actually, light does go around corners in that sense. The easier experiments to do actually are with sound. Um, you need to have a reasonably large room, preferably covered with expensive medieval tapestries uh, to get rid of reflections and so on. Um, to do this, but actually you can see this effect or detect this effect comparing the difference between a door that's wide open, for instance, and a door that's just almost open. I'll tell you what that difference will be in a slide or two's time. Um, but it is an experiment you can do and demonstrate that this stuff happens. Um, now, this spreading out is accentuated if the barrier, the gap, is what we're mostly going to be talking about, uh, is small compared to the wavelength of whatever wave is going through it or past it. Okay, so, you know, for visible light, most of the gaps in everyday life are actually huge compared to its wavelength. Uh, not true if we're talking about looking at microscopic objects. Right, so for you know, there's a whole part of the design of microscopy equipment, for instance, that's based upon aiming for something that is called the diffraction limit. In other words, you can't see things smaller than this because your light is spreading out so much when it goes past these objects or between these objects. Why is that that way around? Why is it the narrower the gap, the more it spreads out? Uh, because the, well, uh, next slide I think will show, but hang on to it, because if the next slides don't answer it, we, we'll come back to it. Um, okay, so, but it's also what drives the whole area of crystallography, for instance, where we have spacings between atoms, which now you all know are going to be something times 10 to the minus 10 of a metre in a solid or a liquid, providing we've got wavelengths that are of that order, and we can definitely make x-rays with wavelengths that are that short, we can use, exploit this phenomenon of, of diffraction in order to get information on, on where the atoms are, basically, uh, within our material. So here's a sort of diagrammatic view, and I'm going to begin, hopefully, to address your question with this. Um, this is the sort of thing, phenomenologically, that we're getting. So we've got plane waves coming into a big gap, so this gap is huge compared to the wavelength of the waves coming in, right? So our diffraction effects are really small. It looks mostly <coughs> like you've got plane waves coming through with a pretty well-defined shadow, right? There is some spreading out at the edges, but it's not huge. Make this gap smaller, and we've essentially got the same effect of each edge on our wave, but because they're closer together now, the combined effect, as it were, is that we get this much, much bigger uh, spreading out around the gap to either side. Um, and these photos at the bottom are from, again, a water tank, a ripple tank, um, demonstrating the same thing. So relatively short wavelength compared to gap, we've got a, quite a well-defined shadow, as it were, the other side. If we take the gap down, so it's now pretty much the same uh, dimensions as the wavelength, uh, our waves are actually beginning to spread out quite noticeably uh, to either side. Um, diagrammatically, that's shown on, on this side over here. And we've already looked early on at using the Huygens geometric principle um, for displaying that. Um, so yeah, so this, this stuff is going to kick in quite 
quite importantly in all sorts of applications and so on. And we'll, we'll talk about radio propagation later in this module, actually, because it's quite an important topic. Um, it's also, you know, this phenomenon, this principle of superposition uh, is absolutely vital for making speed cameras work. All right, we'll, we'll perhaps talk about that later on as well. Um, so, what have we got? Uh, and then there's another picture over here on the right of, of superposition. So, uh, there's a couple of cartoons up here, uh, two of which I discovered this morning are rubbish. Actually, that's yet another uh, rubbish one. Um, so, forgive me, perhaps it was the top of the list rather than the bottom. That looks more like it. So, here's our pulse going through. <coughs> Can't really slow these down very well. Can you see that at the back? It's one is sort of a red broken line, uh, the other one is a blue, blue broken line. So it's showing you the individual pulses as they go through. The bold line is just the addition of the two. So it, it's a straightforward uh, application of the principle of, of superposition. But it's the one down here I really wanted to show you. Um, you know, again, this is one. This is one where actually we don't have a constant phase relationship. So we're not going to get an interference pattern because it's changing at every moment in time. Right? And this is showing you, I suppose, illustrating for you why that is the case. Uh, but all we're doing at every point along here is just adding up the displacement of one wave to the displacement of another. But because one is moving with respect to the other, in other words, the phase between the two is varying with time, it's not constant. So our total, our superposed wave, is also varying with time. All right, so we're, we're never going to get a constant interference back from that sort of relationship. So here's one point source producing its circular waves in our simulated ripple tank. All right, so on their own, that's what they look like. Uh, we've got some damping going on here, which we don't really need, do we? Um, as they progress out. All right, so the key thing now, of course, is to add uh, a second source. So let's keep it all at the same frequency. Um, so two sources now. Let's start again. Uh, operating at the same frequency and the same amplitude. Um, just take it up a little bit until it gets going. All right, so this is where the waves begin to pass through each other in space. And our principle of superposition takes place. And that's all this simulation is doing. It's just adding displacements at one point in space to the other. All right, and we will begin to get, if it doesn't make you feel ill, uh, we begin to get this interference pattern forming, all right? So we've got directions coming out here that are always at about the same angle, blah, 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 blah. All right? It's a relatively constant uh, pattern. All right? The peaks and the individual peaks and troughs are moving, but the pattern, the directions, are now determined by uh, the fact that we've got a constant phase relationship and therefore... Um, therefore a constant uh, arrangement of superposed uh, waves. All right, now exactly the same thing is going to hold if we change the frequency of one source with respect to another. Right, it doesn't matter. We're still going to have a constant phase relationship. Uh, so we're still going to have not only the principle of superposition, which is universal, remember, <coughs> but we're going to have um, an interference pattern created because that phase relationship has stayed uh, the same. All right, so the propagation of the pattern is again going to be constant. Yeah. Are you sure now what happens if the phase differences are different? I'm not sure because this simulation is set up entirely to show you could, if you interference. On the previous one, did you have an option for phase difference? Did you? Yeah, did. All right, let's try that. So, um, it was two sources, one frequency. Yes? 
And where's the phase? Right bottom. Oh, so it is. All right. So let's clear this. All right. And we'll take the phase difference. I don't know what that. I don't know what the scale is on here, but we'll. All right. So one is pushing out wave crests, and the other one, approximately, is pushing out wave troughs. Right, but it's constant. It's doing that all the time in the same way. So all that's going to happen, we're going to get an interference pattern again. All that's going to happen is that it will be shifted a little bit in space. Because it's, it's happening at a slightly different separation, as it were, or set of separations from those two sources. And that's all that's changed. Right, you can go and, I mean, it's, it's easy to find these things. Just put it into Google. A bit of tidying up about refraction, really. A bit of geology, really. Um, the first bullet point is absolutely trivial. We've talked about how we make spherical waves and circular waves and plane waves and so on. Uh, we've done that in water. You can imagine doing it in any other context as well. Geology, or geophysics, I suppose, uh, is a really big area for using uh, um, the generation of, of spherical waves from a point source, right? Um, and then using refraction to probe the structure of the Earth. So if I move on to the uh, slightly prettier diagram on the next slide, this is, <coughs> sorry about the poor contrast, uh, yellows don't come out very well through this projector system, do they? But in terms of a source of waves in the Earth, natural sources are straightforward, right? An earthquake will give you a source of waves. Um, so out of a slippage of this sort, we will get actually both longitudinal and transverse waves. Uh, both appear in, uh, in earthquakes. Uh, in, in geology speak, um, they are called uh, S waves and P waves. Right? S, I think, for surface. P, I think, for pressure. But you need to go and look at a geology book to be sure about that. But that's their nomenclature. But that's essentially what they are. Transverse and longitudinal waves. And they behave rather peculiarly uh, in the Earth in the sense that uh, the, uh, the S waves will refract through the Earth, and they refract through the Earth. Why? Why would they refract? Why would they bend? Could because the Earth is curved. No, it's not because the Earth is curved, sorry. The density, the density is changing, the medium is changing, absolutely. So the wave speed is changing. It, it, it's our basic rationale for why refraction happens. The wave speed is changing. Uh, you know, the outer crust of the Earth is, is a minuscule fraction of the Earth in total. Uh, and once you start going down, you get into, I mean, there's <coughs> major layers sketched out on here, but actually the gradation uh, is a lot finer than that. And, and, you know, if you're prospecting for oil using geophysics, then you're looking at things that are, you know, however many kilometers below, they're still in a tiny a very small fraction of the um, of the outer part of the Earth. Um, so generically, we get this refraction effect going on. This outer core is a fluid, so actually the S waves don't penetrate into that at all. So if we've got our, the source of our S waves at a point on the Earth's surface up here, say, uh, we've got a shadow region around here where we'll actually detect no S waves, no transverse waves at all because um, they simply won't pass through. So, you know, if you've got a series of detectors around the Earth's surface, and there are thousands of detectors on the Earth's surface, um, you know, every country has its own seismology team in one form or another, uh, then it's relatively easy just by looking at where the shadow is to predict where the point of origin must have been. Um, the P waves, however, do go into the outer core, uh, but they don't actually penetrate into the inner core. The reason for that is simply that refraction in this fluid region is really strong. So actually, they always bend out before they've got into the inner core, uh, as it were. So again, we've got a shadow region, sorry, two shadow regions, one there and one there. 
um, because of that. So this is a this is a way of you know probing the Earth's structure. Uh, as I say, if you're uh, looking for oil deposits or whatever, it's a way of looking at cavities of some different medium where the velocity of sound, which is essentially what this is, has changed. Uh, it's all done through a study of how these waves are being refracted, um, well, and reflected, I suppose, between hard boundaries uh, in the Earth's surface. And, and, and it was really, really politically charged um, at this time when uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were doing um, underground tests of nuclear explosions, for instance. <coughs>